70 years after millions of people fled the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, there remain more than 5 million Palestinians registered by the UN as refugees. Many of them live in the still around 60 refugee camps. Those who lost their homes and their livelihoods around the creation of Israel still relying on international aid to survive. Well, Nahr al-Bared is one such camp in the north of Lebanon, which houses some 30,000 displaced Palestinians. It was more than 11 years ago now that it was turned upside down. And until then, little-known jihadist group within the camp, Fatah al-Islam, killed several Lebanese soldiers in their sleep. The response from the military severe. Over a 100-day period, the camp shelled and gradually cleared the most serious clashes seen in Lebanon since the end of the civil war in 1990. The result was the virtual total destruction of Nahr al bared France 24, the only Western media at the time to enter and report from the camp during the battle and to talk to fleeing refugees. There are serious shortages of children's medicine, nappies and milk, not to mention medication for the aged for chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease and cancer. Well, only half of the camp's residents had their houses rebuilt. Many left living outside at the border of their little Palestine as double refugees. Inside the camp that was once an open-air shopping centre, the streets widened to make it easier for Lebanese tanks to move around. Well, Sophia Amara revisits Nahr al bared for France 24. Eleven years ago, we entered the epicentre of the fighting in the siege of Nahar al bared hidden in an ambulance. Today, the camp is in the hands of the army. Strangers and cameras are banned. Your identification, please. Your name? Uh, We're with France 24. We've gone through army intelligence. OK, go ahead. It's OK? During the battle, we lost contact with the family who hosted us in the camp, as it was being bombarded by the army to force out the terrorists. Today, we've tracked that family down. Hi. Mahmoud is the head of the Khatib family. During the battle, he lost his father and the house in which he and his family had hosted us. Ten days after the war started, the first strikes hit the house, and that was just the beginning. How many floors were destroyed? The top three floors, and even on the ground floor, there was only one room left standing. Like the other camp elders, Mahmoud's father refused to flee the family home for fear of losing it in the same way many did when Israel was created in 1948. He didn't want to leave. We stayed put throughout all the bombings. I had flour, oil and an oven. People would gather around me. I needed dough and put it in the oven. Mahmoud would flatten the dough and hand it to me. I had lots of time as well. The camp was empty, no one was cooking. When the smell of thyme flatbread started to spread, it was crazy. People came from far, attracted by the smell. The Khatibs waited eight years to be rehoused. But despite their hardship, they've been luckier than many. The ruins of war are still visible throughout the camp. In the Lebanese mountains, we're reunited with a senior officer who took part in the battle. Pierre Assaf threw us out of Nahar al bared during the fighting. According to the retired army general, there was no other option. In order to smoke out the terrorists of Fatah al-Islam, the camp had to be razed to the ground. The problem was that once they had taken the refugees hostage, we couldn't attack. And once the refugees had been evacuated, the terrorists took their homes and they started shooting at us from the houses. They entrenched themselves and fought to their last breath. Under the army bombardment, the upper floors, made of stone, collapsed, creating fortifications over the concrete ground floors. 
We did shoot, but they were protected. So we could shoot at them, bomb them, it made no difference. We had created real shelters for them. The destruction was inevitable, but of course that was not our intention, not at all. Back at the former battlefield of Nahr al-Barid, the scars of war remain. Reconstruction follows the same pace as the flow of donations, far too slow for the refugees. Careful, go on down, careful. 500 new homes are being completed on this site. Zaidan runs a masonry business. For him, far too little has been done. In 11 years, only half the camp has been rebuilt. It was $400 million. The whole camp could have been rebuilt in three years. Donations are paid in fits and starts to UNRWA, the UN agency that runs the reconstruction effort. UNRWA doesn't have its own money. Everything comes from donor countries. If everything had been finished in three years, all of them, the architects, the employees, the thousands of workers, they'd all have been out of a job, on the street. Three quarters of the architects and the contractors are UNRWA employees. How do you think they get paid? These operational costs come out of the $240 million paid out so far for the reconstruction. On the outskirts of the camp, 15,000 refugees are caught in an endless waiting game for their new homes. They're housed in prefabricated iron shacks, barely livable in both summer and winter. In summer, rats proliferate, huge rats weighing more than five kilos. And where there are rats, you can be sure you're going to find snakes too. Look, look, there's a rat, there's a dead rat right here. In winter, the sewers overflow, bringing with them a swathe of infections transmitted by all sorts of insects. Look at this child. This is an example of what the kids are exposed to in the barracks. Look at that, a simple mosquito bite did that. Look at his hands. Look at his feet. See, it's spread to the rest of his body. And that's all the result of mosquitoes. All these kids are exposed to these illnesses. You've been ill for a long time? A long time. Hardship here is more than skin deep. Zaidan insists on showing us little Karim's home. He and his family of five live in this iron shack. See, here are the shacks. This here is for sleeping. It's a bedroom. Five meters by two and a half. This is where they sleep, where they eat and entertain their friends, where they spend their evenings. And they've been away from home for 11 years without a proper roof over their heads. 11 years because their home in the former camp was destroyed. Karim's mother, Aziza, knows their precarious situation could deteriorate further. Since 1949, UNRWA has served as a lifeline for Palestinian refugees. But now, the Trump administration has cut its funding. Still, Aziza remains defiant. When it comes down to it, we don't care about Trump or anyone else's decisions. Our people are very strong. We've suffered in the past and we still suffer today. But we're able to keep standing and endure more suffering to go back to our country. We don't care if we don't have food or water. He wants to deprive us of UNRWA aid? No, he won't be able to fight us with that. The refugees view the American decision as humanitarian blackmail. Its aim, to impose Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Just another challenge for the residents of this little Palestine, getting by on so little. Every month, these volunteers collect donations from refugees to finance the treatment of cancer patients in the camp. 
Even before the American budget cuts, UNRWA only covered 50% of the costs. A woman dropped a full bag, several million. How much did you find in the bag? A lot? We were amazed it was a lady, a passerby, who put the money in the box, but as volunteers, it's not our job to count it. We hand over the donations to our managers, and they're the ones who count it. We don't even know who the donor was. A spontaneous act of solidarity, but it's nowhere near enough. Before it was destroyed by the war, Nahr al barid was a veritable open-air shopping centre lying near Syria, where the camp's traders used to pick up their wares at low prices. It drew customers from across northern Lebanon, half empty today. It functions as a closed economy. Farhan has taken over his father's shop and often has a long wait for customers. This is the Palestinian flag. It's in high demand. We also have the Eiffel Tower from your country. It's very popular. My customers love France. Why? They love it. The French are very supportive of the Palestinian cause. Farhan is a graphic designer. But in Lebanon, that's one of around 70 professions that are off limits to Palestinians. Waiting for a better future, he's left to spend his days sitting in an empty shop. The camp is in ruins financially. There isn't... there's no economy in the camp. If I clear a small banknote, the same notes will leave my shop and go to the butchers, the grocer, the taxi driver, only to come back to me and then go out again. So the same amount of money goes round in circles from one shopkeeper to another. Since the war of Nahr al barid Lebanese customers have shunned the camp which now requires a military pass to gain access. I wrote a rap song about the passes here in the camp, and I sang it. It's called How's It Going? In his infinite spare time, Farhan, a.k.a. MC, uses music to criticise the restrictions afflicting the camp and the misery they fuel. Soon, Farhan won't sing in Nahr al barid anymore. In a few weeks, he'll leave the camp where he was born for further exile in Belgium. Like all the camp's residents, Zaydan, the site manager, lost his home during the 2007 war. It's still in ruins today. The slow pace of reconstruction, too, has pushed many refugees into exile. This was the home of a Palestinian family left abandoned 11 years ago when they emigrated. The house wasn't spared by the war, and the damage you see is from the fighting. Those are bullet holes. And we don't know what became of this family. It's a loss for the camp because they're not here anymore. But it's also a loss for the cause because they left, leaving behind their people and their struggle. They've settled in another country, and maybe they'll be absorbed into that society. As a result, bit by bit, our cause is fading and dying out. For Palestinians, the central pillar of their cause is the right of return for refugees. At the Khatibs, nostalgia for the destroyed camp lives on. A part of their history lies buried beneath the ruins. They destroyed our memories, our beautiful childhood memories. Everything was left shattered in the rubble. I have no more memories, no more past. The alleyways I used to play in as a child were full of memories for me. They've wiped out our memories in the same way our parents' memories were wiped out in Palestine. This bottle contains earth from Alma in Palestine. I retrieved it from the rubble of our house in the destroyed camp. My village. It's earth from the village of Alma in Palestine. 
All that we had left of Palestine, or very nearly everything, was destroyed in the camp. And yet, their attachment to living inside the camp remains intact. It's a form of intentional ghettoization to symbolize the urgency of returning. What am I going to do with two or three hundred square meters in Lebanon when I have thousands in Palestine? Even if we live here and become landowners, our goal is to return to Palestine. And it will happen. My father didn't have time to go back, and maybe we won't either. But one day, one of our children will eventually return home and justice will be done. For the residents of Nahr al-Barad, as for millions of Palestinian refugees, fighting against forgetfulness is the ultimate weapon in the struggle for the right of return. Sophia Amara revisiting Na al Bared for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. Thanks for watching. More news in just a moment.